backpacks have been packed, the school lunches have been made, and we are back to school Houston. Hi, I'm Megan. I'm the co-owner of Houston Moms. There's so much that goes into back to school year. There's so much excitement. There's a lot of nerves. Um, if you're sending your kid um, on to school for the first time, or maybe they're going to a higher grade, um, there's just a lot that comes with that. Um, and so today we are going to focus on something very specific, um, and we are talking learning disabilities. So if you have a kiddo with a learning disability or you suspect you have a kid with a learning disability, then this video is very much for you. Um, I am always honored to have UTMB Health um, partnering with us in these really informational health videos. And um, you've seen my guest here before, Dr. Kashana. It's with um, UTMB Health. She is a child psychologist, um, but she is... Um, she actually got her doctorate in school psychology. So wealth of information. Can't wait to dig in. Hey, Dr. G, how are you? Hey, I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, we always love it when you're here. Um, so much to get into. So back to school. Um, we kind of alluded to it. Nerves are high. Um, we're expecting new curriculum. The kids are learning new things. They're being overwhelmed with some things. Um, but as it relates to learning disabilities, let's start in general. What causes learning disabilities? What does that all encompass? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the simple answer is biology. Uh, there is no way to specify necessarily for each kid or for each um disorder, but for the most part, they're typically either hereditary or genetic, um, or they're acquired sometimes in prenatal or postnatal periods, very early childhood typically. Um, and for the most part, they, like I said, if it's not genetic, um, usually it's something related to like a premature birth or exposure to toxins like lead, um, sometimes uh, fetal exposure to substances, things like that, um, that can kind of impair the biology when it's in its early development. That's typically where we see the cause of learning disabilities or learning disorders come from. Okay. So when we're talking about learning disabilities, what kind of spectrum are we talking about? Because um, I have a kid with dyslexia. Um, so that would be one that I'm highly familiar with, but what what is kind of the broad breadth, I guess, like it feels like yeah. there might be a lot. Yeah. Well, I think that's a common misunderstanding, actually. I don't, there's not probably as many as people think there are, um, because we do kind of live in this pop culture world where everything's turned into a disorder, a disability. Um, so I think that can make us feel a little bit like, wow, there's probably so much going on. Um, the reality is that about 10% of people in our country do have a learning disability, um, and I use those terms interchangeably. Sorry if I didn't mention that earlier. Disorder and disability, they're used the same. Um, disorder is kind of more of a categorical, like a medical diagnosis. Um, disability is a very specific legal term when it comes to learning disabilities. And it's used in schools or workplace Um and so I just want to be clear, if I'm going back and forth, I'm sorry, it means the same thing, essentially. Um, so learning disabilities are typically very specific related to learning. Um, it has to do with how your brain takes in and organizes and uses information in school that typically shows up with a specific learning disability in something like math, reading, or writing. And that's where we see dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia. Um, those are specific learning disabilities that affect how we, how our brain processes information in, in these kind of academic ways. Um, they're considered verbal because it uses language and, and numbers. Um, there's also nonverbal learning disabilities, though, that have to do with things like problem solving, social abilities, visual spatial skills. And these are usually based on differences in things like executive functioning or, um, things like attention, working memory, just processing speed in general, um, it, it really comes down to how the brain's working 
the one thing that isn't a learning disability that a lot of people think of is intellectual disabilities. So IQ or low cognitive functioning is completely different. So a lot of people with learning disabilities have very high or average high IQ, um, whereas an intellectual disability is where our cognitive and intellectual functioning is a lot lower. Oh, okay. So interesting. Thank you for explaining the disorder and disability because we hear it a lot. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I guess for purposes of this conversation, since we're talking about school, like so disability yeah. kind of applies. Um, yeah. Speaking of school, so how do learning disabilities affect our kiddos in the classroom? Oof. Um, it can be all sorts of ways. It, Of course, it depends on the specific um, issue going on. Um, you'll see it academically most often parents will say things or teachers will say things like I know they can do it I know they have the potential they're just not making the grades or they're falling way behind and we see this kind of mismatch in what we know they're capable of and what they're actually mm -hmm. performing or how they're performing um, that's the biggest one when it comes to grades and academic performance um, I think the one that most teachers are going to um, talk, talk to parents about one that parents will see at home is the behavioral pieces, which is often looks like refusing to do work, um, not wanting to go to school at all, very like negative self-critical talk about I'm stupid or my teacher hates me, um, getting anxious sometimes before like group work, just things like that where we see almost like um, some defiance, uh, but typically it's not defiance from wanting to learn or being there it's the difficulty that they have with performing these tasks especially in a public setting like a classroom um so I will tell our friends um who are watching this um I have twins and um so I kind of had a front row seat to see the difference between one I guess um yeah. quote unquote Nor normal learner I don't know if that's like the the proper way to say that but um, one that seemed to be developing regularly and then the other one who struggled. And um, I probably identified it like in kindergarten. Um, I'm like, we're just not doing the same thing. But, um, you know, schools, every school has their different processes. Of, it's so, so lucky for two to have like the direct comparison in your own home. That's a lot of parents, especially first time parents, have no clue what they're supposed to be looking yes. for, how they can compare. And it, of course, we don't want to always compare our kids because kids develop at different rates. <laughs> Delays are different than disabilities. So um, I think that's important to remember. But yeah, I, I think uh, for the word that you're most likely looking for is typical and atypical. We, we try to avoid normal and abnormal. Or I do. <laughs> Thank you for yeah. that. Because like so I don't get the verbiage right. So yes. Okay. Perfect. Now I know. Um, and I, I tease with people now. My kids are in eighth grade. So I kind of had my own little science experiment at home where I was seeing one thing here. You know, they were same gestation, same parents, you know, all the deals. Mm -hmm. um, but it turned out well for us. But if you are a mom sitting at home and you are thinking, mm, like I'm seeing some of these behavioral things, or I'm I'm seeing maybe them not come home and feel successful, like what are the tips there? Um, if you suspect that there might be um some sort of learning disability, because I think um, and I'll get on my soapbox, I'm sure later, but um you know, moms and dads are like at the front lines, right? So we know our child best. And so we we're seeing them a lot, but in all fairness, the teachers are also seeing them seven hours a day, plus or minus 25 kids. So what is your best advice if you suspect that something may just not be quite right? Yeah. If you're suspecting it, the odds are that the school is too. So just talk to them. Um, 
a lot of times schools are doing something called RTI or response to intervention before parents even realize that they're doing it. And it's a formal way of the school kind of asking this question of what's going on here. Is it something we need to evaluate further? Or if we just make some tweaks, you know, can we help this kid get on track? Um, there's there's high odds that, it, well, I shouldn't say high these days, but there are good odds, you know, in most school districts in this region that the teachers are paying attention to that too. So I would say ask, um, you know, open communication with teachers, see how things are going. Um, if you're in daycare or um, preschool, it's not too early to identify and deal with these things. So, um, you know, the earlier, the better. So just communicate, talk to other moms, other parents, see how things are are going for their kids at that age. Um, and then, of course, you know, talk to a professional, ask your pediatrician what's typical. Most pediatricians are more than happy to talk about what's appropriate developmentally and they are very careful to make sure you know it's a range of ages where you should see certain things. Um, at the end of the day, though, our schools, public schools, are given significant federal funding to evaluate these concerns. So if you do seriously think that something might be happening with your kid, request an evaluation. It's their job and their duty to do that. Um, and typically I say do that in writing because then they're legally required to respond within 45 days, whether they get started or at least acknowledge and get the process going for you. Um, shoot them an email, write a note, take it up to the assistant principal, just whatever you need to do to kind of communicate that something needs to be done. That's solid advice there because it really is important that you get every, everything in writing and um, because timelines start with these public schools and, and so they have X amount of days to respond to your written request. Then there's a five-day waiting period you can waive and then they can actually start the testing, but then they have so many days to complete the testing days. Yeah. and then have the results back to you. And by then it can last like almost a semester. So it sometimes goes longer than that. If you're if your school district's not well resourced and they're sharing a school psychologist who's doing all this testing, I've seen it take a whole year before. It shouldn't, but it can. So I think the lesson there is if you if you suspect anything, um please do tap into your school um and, and do it, you know do it now and um, it never and, hurts to evaluate and I yeah. always tell parents too if you're wrong great then you get a list of your child's strengths and weaknesses like you don't have to have a diagnosis to make it worth it yeah no yeah I mean what an insight it is into your kid mm -hmm. and so um which kind of brings me to my next point um, so we diagnosed, um, I say we, school district diagnosed my child, um, at the end of first grade, um, she was in first grade. And so she knew that like reading was tough for her. Um, but something that one of her interventionists told us was they, they name it, they claim it. So she's like, Quinn is dyslexic. Don't tell her differently. Like she has dyslexia and she needs to own that. And it needs to be part of kind of who she is. And it doesn't define Quinn, yep. but it is a little bit, uh, it is part of her and it's part of how different and unique her brain is. What it, What does your school psychology, child psychology brain say to that? How do we, how do we help these kids kind of learn to understand um, and, and take it as a positive rather than a negative. Yeah, I love that. I fully support that idea. And I think it's a really great one. Um, I, you know, and this is true with any, I'm a psychologist, not just in school. So I do work with a lot of kids with mental health um, labels as well. And I, I think it's really important to be open and honest, especially if kids have questions being able to say like, you know what, this is what's going on. Here's what it means. Um, meeting with a, someone like me, a therapist or a psychologist, um, making that diagnosis to let them um, explain what is this like? Um, how is it going to show up for you? What does it mean about you? That can be really helpful. Some kids are very curious. Some kids 
don't want anything to do with it. And that can be a process too of just letting them have time to accept and understand and get educated. Um, but yeah, education and communication is important. Also, I almost always share with kids um, different celebrities who are experiencing the same thing um, or famous people and, and any right characters um, because it can be really validating to know you're not alone. And dyslexia, for example, it's like 80% of learning disabilities. So it's a very common learning disability and a lot of people deal with it. So kind of normalizing and letting people know, you know, this is kind of cool. Here's your superpower. Here's the thing that you can do differently or better than other people. I love that so much. It almost brought tears back to my eyes because um, I remember right after Quinn was diagnosed and there somebody sent me an article and I had all these celebrities and, and they were on video talking about their particular LDs. And, and James Vanderbeek, now I'm going to age myself. <laughs> Dawson's Creek. <laughs> <laughs> Dawson's Creek. Thank you for knowing that. I wasn't sure if you met the age criteria for that okay, one. Yes, I do. Um, but any of my 40 plus people, um, we we had, we love some Dawson, right? Um, and he talked about how it made him a better um, filmmaker and um, mm -hmm. a better actor mm -hmm. and because he, he saw things differently. And I, I told my daughter about it and she's like, well, yeah, mom, I see things in pictures. So when she's reading something, she like, so when she reads the word tree, she sees a tree. Not the legend. Yeah. And I'm like, that's such a cool way to be able to live. And, and I don't know, I just, so yes, I love the idea of giving them um, hope and inspiration through other people and, and be like, this is not, this is just like, this is a blip. This is chapter. Um, it doesn't define the book of who you are. Yep. Um, but it's something that you have to be aware of because as you and I were talking about earlier, before we started filming, um, there are things that these kiddos need to be aware of as they progress through their school head, schoolhood journey, um, whether it's the jump to middle school or the jump to high school or high school, even beyond into the real world. What is your best advice for these, these jumps, especially if you're going from, you know, hey, you were 18 or 17 and you were on accommodations and all of this. Um, and now, hi, here's college. What do we yeah. do about that? Well, there are actual programs for this and most school districts have access to them. Their quality, you know, depends on the area and the region. But um, I was, I have to toot my sister's horn here. The other Dr. Gashanis, she's up at Sam Houston State and she actually researches this. This is her area of expertise is transition programs in, in school districts in Texas. And I think um, it's really important to remember that these adjustment periods that kids have when they're going from one like major grade shift, like elementary to middle or even middle to high school is really tough for a lot of kids. And then again to college and then from college to work life, those things um, require significant skills to, to manage. And kids with learning disabilities sometimes have a disadvantage there because they haven't gotten mastered those skills that they might need or they haven't reached the the potential that they you know have planned for themselves before everything shifts you know so it can be really tough it's it's a big adjustment and there you do have to make sure they're getting the supports that they need and really advocating for them at an early age and then helping them as soon as you can learn to advocate for themselves and that was something you and I had chatted about too, is the the importance of our kids knowing how to advocate for themselves and knowing their accommodations. So typically these learning disabilities, I'm going to say typically, they're going to fall under what's like a 504, most likely, um, unless it, it may be like, a, um, like an ARD, what's the other, IEP. IEP, um, yeah. Just and so on. you're going to either fall under an IEP or a 504, but regardless, you're going to have yearly meetings or meetings at, as much as you want to request, right? What, what can you share about what parents need to know about these 504 and IEP meetings? 
Yeah, it can be a really intimidating process. Um, and honestly, a lot of times the communication's really poor and it's hard to know. Um, I think that it's really important to make sure that you're understanding your own rights, yours and your student uh, or your, your child, um, and communicating constantly with schools. I think it's really important to stay on top of it. And unfortunately, I, I tell parents a lot especially with 504, because it's not as uh, legalized as the IEP. Um, it's kind of a more informal version of accommodations um, that are made for students, but they're not necessarily required or always accessible. So kids and parents have to demand them. They have to ask for change. They have to ask for them to be provided. And that's true into life, um, adult life too. And when you get to college, you have to actually request that you get these accommodations. They don't just get passed on like they do from elementary to high school. Um, and then in work life too, you can apply for accommodations and work as an adult through the state, but people don't often realize that. So these early advocacy skills can be really important. Um, I tell parents, make a binder with some information, keep copies of things and have the kid know where it is, know how to read it, know how to access the information that they need, when their appointments are, that kind of thing. And that's true for like medical diagnoses too, but just help them learn how to manage it themselves. I had no idea that that was even available in the workplace too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dyslexia accommodations are available as an adult as well. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to tell my kid when she gets home from school. She's going to be so pumped. I'll send you um, some websites with, with some information on stuff like that. I would love it. Um, and we can definitely drop that in the comments below. I, I think um, the thing is, it can be scary um, when you hear that your child, you know, potentially or does have a learning disability. Because if you... Um, for ours, it seemed to kind of come out of, I know we had talked about them maybe being genetic. And then I was like, huh, that's weird. But then I started thinking about the things that I do that I think that's where it came from. Me, I just didn't know because my coping mechanisms were such like, you know, there's, there's a lot of coping mechanisms that these kids do and they do it on a daily basis, which, sorry, I know this is kind of going off the cuff here because that re made me think of something when my kiddo was getting so frustrated at school she was coming home exhausted every single day and I think it was the it was how hard she had to cope to get through the day can you kind of speak to that like how hard their little brains are working yes there it's overdrive and this is true for kids with other neurobehavioral disorders too like ADHD autism mm -hmm. Um, that's one of those behavioral markers of like the crash and burn uh, when they <laughs> come home from school, whether it's an emotional meltdown or they literally crash and go to sleep. Um, that's normal for most kids to an extent, but when it's a, a pattern and it's interfering with other functioning, um, other things that they need to be doing, it's definitely a sign to look into. Um, yeah, they're having to keep it together all day long, sit still, be quiet, listen, learn the things that are really hard to do when you have a brain that wants to do other things. Mm. It can be really tough. Yeah, I just, you know, I, I, I got so much respect for my kid after she was diagnosed. Like, man, you've been holding it together the best you know how. And yeah. um, I think our kids, with a brain that learns just a little bit differently is a pretty cool thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thankful for people like you who can help them, help them navigate, like what can be a really, you know, difficult diagnosis and help the parents navigate. I know we covered kind of a bunch of stuff here. Is there anything I missed or any other resources that you think would be helpful for our moms and dads? I'll definitely send some resources, um, websites, things like Disability Rights, Navigate Life. There's an organization called Texas Project First. It's just like all the information you could possibly need to understand all of this stuff when it comes to like the legal side. Um, the National Association of School Psychology has so many really good resources on their website. 
Um, and then I do also want to give a shout out to another friend of mine, Danica Maddox, who's a psychologist now, I think in San Francisco, but she um, and I went to grad school together and she focuses on a group of kids called Twice Exceptional. I don't know if you've heard of them, but it's where you have an intellectual exception ability. So like you're very high intelligence, but you also have a learning disability, which typically is masked by your intellectual functioning. And so a lot of these kids who are very highly intelligent and have a learning disability or a neurobehavioral disability get lost in the system because they function so well academically that people don't really buy it that they have this issue that they really, really do need support with. And that can be doubly hard on kids um, to understand that difference that they have, even though they're very, very intelligent, their brains still can't do this thing in the same way that another kids can do it. It doesn't matter how smart you are. Yeah. And then um, for parents too, just to understand, like, how do I advocate for my kid when the school says there's nothing wrong with them? They're very smart. They're very intelligent. Um, so she has a great resource. Her, her, um, website's called the gifted learning lab, and she has like a free newsletter, lots of really great information. That's perfect. We will definitely drop that too in the comments. And, um, again, I think that, that touches to like parents, like, if you suspect, please like fight. Yeah. Like you may have to fight um a little bit. Um I think the odds are high that, that you do. I you know, and um I I share my journey a lot with it because I do think it's important. Um, but there were we did the RTI, we um we had the conferences. And I talked to the specialist, like, they're like, you know, she's an A student. She's making 98s and 100s. Yeah. We don't. And I'm like, so we're just going to wait till she fails. Is that the idea? Yeah. No, <laughs> exactly. And so I'm like, and I wasn't willing to do that. And so for moms out there who may be feeling similar, I want to give you empower you. This is your right within the state of Texas. If you suspect something um, and you, and you've talked to the teacher, you can request this yep. um, and it's okay. And like Dr. G said, the worst thing that happens is the, you know, responses come back and you have a deeper dive into what makes up your, your child, um, which that never can hurt anything. So right. Gosh, I could go on all day about um, learning disabilities and dyslexia and all of those things, but um, we wanted um, to really provide some resources for you guys. And I know Dr. G has, has done that and, and we are going to drop the rest of her recommendations where you can look for support. Um, Dr. G, uh, I love having you. Thank you. I love being here. Yeah, you're such a such a wealth of knowledge. Um, and again, Dr. G is um one of our child psychologists um with UTMB Health, who is our preferred provider for the Bay Area, Galveston, League City, that entire area. But we are wishing the entire Houston area back to happy back to school. Um almost feels like there's a chill in the air. So we're we're getting closer friends um, and um, we're wishing you a great 2024-2025 school year and um, we'll be back next month with another hot health topic. Until then, we'll see ya.